Hi, everyone. Hello. How are you doing, Alex? Hi there. Thanks for joining, Hello. everyone. We appreciate Ooh, it. We'll be starting so. in a few minutes. Good afternoon. It's nice to see familiar faces. But we'll be starting in a few minutes, so I'm letting everybody in now. Thank you. Hello, Tony Woodson. Alex. Hey, hi there, Carl. Carl Gustafson. Wow. Howdy, Carl. <clears throat> We got your schedule, man. Oh, my God, there's Tim Mason down there. Hey, hey, Carl, how's it going? All right, good to see you. Same here. Hey, there, Sam. Tim Mason, good to hey, see you. Barbara. Hey, how's it going? Williams. It's so far, there's 51 here. <laughs> Alexander Perez, I think you were the one that sent me a form when I was in the Keck Hospital. Was it you that uh, guided us to fill it out, I think? Uh, it was probably me, yeah. yeah. Oh, no. either, either Randy Henderson or myself. But yeah, thanks for, uh, thanks for attending. We appreciate it. Good afternoon, everybody. Hi there. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <clears throat> Greetings from Murrieta. Yes. Hi, everyone. And thank you for, uh, for joining us uh, this afternoon. We really appreciate it. Uh, we'll be starting in just a bit. Uh, just wanted to mention just some housekeeping uh, things that we want to keep in mind. If Please, if you could all uh, mute yourselves um, until we have our, our question and answer session. Uh, so please uh, uh, mute yourself and now. This is a Zoom uh, Hi from there. Keck on trans. Hi there. <laughs> Yes, this is our this is a transfusion free lecture series. Oh. So welcome. So please, if everyone can mute themselves at this time, so we can get started and uh, remain muted, please, so we don't have any uh, the other room. any Why noise. And we want to please ask that you reserve your questions for the physicians and for our administrator until after their presentation. And if you'd like, you can also. Um, write it in into the chat area. So welcome, welcome to Keck Medicine of USC, our transfusion-free lecture series. We're very grateful that you accepted our invitation and, and that you've logged on. So thank you very much. Uh, Keck Medicine encompasses our three hospitals, uh, Keck uh, Medical Center of USC, our Keck, uh, USC Norris Comprehensive Cancer Center, and USC Verdugo Hills Hospital. Um, and we're gonna go ahead and get started uh, we're going to listen to our physician uh, guest, Dr. Hendoyan, who is our professor of clinical medicine and interventional cardiologist. And his theme is acute coronary syndromes, how to deal with getting more blood to the heart without a transfusion. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Hendoyan. It's a pleasure. Thank you, Alex, uh, for that warm introduction. Um, so. It's, it's a pleasure, and I think this, um, this topic is very appropriate because right before I came on, I'm in scrubs because um, we did a heart attack on a patient who um, had a very low hemoglobin, and so we deal with uh, blood issues all the time about what to do and, and how to manage it, and so we work very closely with our cardiothoracic colleagues uh, with a lot of Jehovah's Witness patients about how to get them the appropriate care, especially when it comes to increased blood flow to their heart without, uh, with respecting um, everything about um, not um, proceeding with transfusions if we have. So with that, we're gonna talk about the heart, but I will throw in some themes about how to prevent um, blood loss and what we do in the cath lab. So let's go to the next slide. So we're gonna, um, we're gonna talk about the three types of uh, heart attacks. We're gonna talk about uh, the medical therapy we use to treat them and how do we uh, revascularize patients. And we're gonna talk about um, how, um, how these medications affect um, bleeding and, um, and how we balance that out with, um, with, with minimizing the amount of blood loss while still getting the artery open. Next slide. 
So the three types of heart attacks we have include unstable angina, which people have typical symptoms of chest pain, shortness of breath. Uh, they do have um, EKG changes, but they don't leak enzymes. So it's, it's right at the beginning of a heart attack, but there hasn't been any damage to the heart as of yet. Next, we get to non-ST elevation myocardial infarction, and that's just getting into the weeds. Basically, what that means is the difference is that people have symptoms, they have EKG changes, suggesting that there is, um, there is decreased blood flow to the heart, but here you see um, enzymes going up, showing that there is damage to the heart. And then there is an ST elevation myocardial infarction, and that's that's when you have a complete occlusion of an artery. And so th these are the cases where when somebody presents to the emergency room or when they call 911, that you see the EKG changes and they are rushed directly uh, to the cath lab so that we could get that artery open. Next slide. So um, this is a considerable problem because as of 2016, um, over 50 million individuals had coronary artery disease in the United States. Um, over half a million new myocardial infarctions occur each year throughout the United States. Just as of today, I took care of two of these patients. 57% um, are men and 43% are female. Men tend to have it earlier than females. Um, and that's likely due to um, the protective uh, hormones that um, that females produce up until menopause. And then um, about a third of acute coronary syndrome uh, presenting to the hospital are uh, STEMIs, which get rushed up to the cath lab uh, immediately. So next slide. So you can see that the incidence of um, acute um, heart attack is going down slowly, and that's represented by the um, black line, and that's due to better diet, smoking cessation, um, better medical therapy. But you see in the blue line that uh, the rate of non-STMIs is about the same. However, the, um, the acute heart attacks where we need to rush you to the cath lab, that has been decreasing um, at a much greater pace, which is, which is a good thing because um, it shows that the medical therapy that we have is working. Next slide. So um, who is at risk? Um, it's people who have modifiable risk factors and non-modifiable. So modifiable risk factors are things we could change such as diabetes, smoking, high blood pressure, and high cholesterol. Non-modifiable risk factors include age. As we all get older, our risk of um, coronary artery disease increases. Sex, uh, men, like I said, tend to have more acute disease uh, earlier on. And then uh, family history and then genetic predisposition. The patient that uh, we did today at Tech uh, has a strong family history and um, had a stent 37 years ago. And he's 60 years old. So um, he received his second and third stents today. Next slide. So um, what happens in the artery? So as you can see um, in the artery, in the yellow, you have plaque being deposited in the artery wall. And then with an acute heart attack, in the second slide, you see um, a little rupture in the plaque. And that's represented by that red fissure. And so what happens is all that lipid-rich material of the plaque is exposed to the blood. And when the, when the platelets in the blood see that, um, they go and attach to it and they form a clot. And that clot, um, that clot blocks the artery and causes blood to um, not be able to flow downstream. And in order to bust the clot, you need to give medications that thin the blood. And, um, and just like anywhere else, they help dissolve the clot but they also increase the risk of bleeding um, as we go forward. So we always need to balance what we're gonna give to bust a clot versus how much bleeding are we gonna, um, are we gonna be able to sustain and be able to treat effectively. Next slide. So um, 
the presentation that patients present with include acute pressure like chest pain, shortness of breath. Sometimes they have a belly pain, such as our patient um, today. Um, sometimes you can have sudden cardiac death due to um, catastrophic arrhythmias. And then um, in diabetics and in the elderly or people who've had heart transplants, you can have a silent progression of symptoms. Next slide. So um, unstable angina and non-STEMI, like I mentioned, have classic EKG changes, which are uh, pointed out in the green arrow. These are things for the cardiologist to deal with. And those just know that those changes uh, tell us that there is decreased blood flow uh, to the heart happening acutely. Next slide. And then with the, um, with the STMIs, you see big elevations, which are different. And that helps us distinguish on EKG um, what type of heart attack an individual is having. Next slide. So uh, time is of the essence with all acute coronary syndrome. So we, when you present to the emergency room or in the field, a uh, history is taken about your symptoms, the physical is done, an EKG um, is performed, and then oxygen is given. Uh, nitroglycerin helps uh, with the chest pain. Um, labs are done and a cardiologist is called to help determine the timing of uh, testing and if they need to go to the cath lab or not. Next slide. So we're gonna start talking about uh, a STEMI. And so uh, go ahead with the next slide. So again, when you have a STEMI, which is the one where you need to be rushed to the, um, to the cath lab, you wanna um, go ahead and open that artery within 90 minutes. Um, if, um, if you present to a hospital that doesn't have a cath lab, then uh, you should be transferred to a hospital within 120 minutes that is capable of opening an artery with a cath lab. And if you aren't able to be transferred to that hospital that has a cath lab, fibrinolytics are given. Fibrinolytics are very strong medications that cause uh, blood clots to dissolve. They also um, have a very high bleeding risk. So go to the next slide. So uh, fibrinolytics were started in the 80s to treat um, to treat heart attacks. Um, obviously, the sooner it's given, the better. Um, it's only for the STEMI type of heart attacks, not the non-STEMIs or APS. And they do have absolute and relative contraindications, which is important for any patient, but especially if a patient's a Jehovah's Witness. Next slide. So um, again, this slide shows that, um, the green line shows that the benefit after three hours starts to taper off. So you want to give them as soon as possible. Next slide. So what are the um, contraindications? So absolute contraindications include history of intracranial hemorrhage, a bleeding in the brain, um, malignant um, lesions um, in the brain, um, a history of a stroke less than three months, um, an aortic dissection, active bleeding, which does not include menses, or closed head trauma. Relative contraindications include uh, blood pressure, which is greater than 180 millimeters of mercury, history of an ischemic stroke, pregnancy, recent surgery, or on blood thinning therapy already. Now, uh, it's important to note that in these contraindications, it does not say that if you're a Jehovah's Witness, you should hold treatment. Um, however, uh, when you give these medications and, and you see the complications of some people start hemorrhaging, um, you gotta be prepared to deal with them and to have a discussion with your patient that these we're giving these medications to bust the clot that is probably causing a blockage in your heart artery. But, um, but the downside of these medications is that you can have a massive hemorrhage and that's why we need to go down this checklist and to discuss it with you to make sure that, um, that we understand why we're giving it. Thank goodness the majority of the hospitals in um, Southern California do have a cath lab and therefore um, these discussions um, happen much more rarely, but they do happen. Next slide. 
so um, when you give lytic therapy, the way you judge that you had a, success of, a successful therapy is you see resolution of those EKG changes, you see resolution of the symptoms and the person becomes more hemodynamically stable. Next slide. So, um, so this slide shows that um, in the era, in the current era where we take patients to the cath lab and open arteries with balloons and stents, that the um, rate of vessel patency is much higher when we take them to the cath lab versus with lytic therapy. Now we will talk about um, the medications, the blood thinners that we give in the cath lab in future slides, but that's why we prefer to take patients to the cath lab versus give them lytic therapy um, in the current era. Next slide. Um, let's go to the next slide. And so again, um, so when we take patients to the cath lab, again, just like with the lytic slide, getting the patient to the cath lab earlier is, um, is the key. And so the sooner the better, as you can see after three hours, the, um, the, the uh, line plaque goes out. And so uh, opening the, uh, the artery is very important and in a timely manner. Next slide. So we're gonna talk about unstable angina and non stemming next slide. And so again, um, we, we assess somebody's risk because we have a little bit more time. And we have uh, criteria, which you see in blue, that um, helps us determine uh, who would um, benefit the most by going to the capital. And those are the criteria that we use. Next slide. Um, next slide. So, um, so we have two ways of proceeding um, when somebody has unstable angina or non stable If they're high risk, um, we take an early invasive approach, which means we take them to the cath lab sooner. Um, and those include high-risk patients, patients who've had coronary disease in the past, who've had heart attacks in the past, patients who have ongoing chest pain or who are hemodynamically unstable. Those who have low ejection fractions, meaning that their heart isn't pumping um, in a usual fashion. However, um, we also can employ an ischemia-driven approach in patients who are lower risk, who don't have chest pain, who are hemodynamically stable, and the pumping of their heart is preserved. Now, in these patients, we give them the same medication. However, we don't give them um, certain blood thinners um, that we would while we are placing a stent. So that is a way, especially if somebody um, has a low hemoglobin, to treat them effectively without putting them at risk for uh, further bleeding, especially if you can't control the bleeding. Next slide. So, um, so these medications are very important um, when we treat a patient, regardless if they go to the cath lab or not. So we treat them with aspirin, which is a blood thinner, but we also give them a super aspirin, um, which includes Plavix, um, Effiant, or ticacrolone. And these medications further prevent those platelets from sticking together, again, but increase risk of bleeding. Now, we also give uh, blood thinners, which work on the platelets in a different fashion. Um, again, those uh, include heparin, which is the most common. There's injectables like Lovenox and bivalerudin. And these medications all thin the blood further uh, working in a different mechanism to help dissolve that clot before we could go in and put a stent. Um, next slide. So um, the studies have shown, this basically shows that, um, that Plavix was um, at a high dose was, um, was more helpful in people having heart attacks versus lower doses. And there were studies earlier which showed Plavix versus no Plavix, when you give somebody Plavix, it was beneficial. Next slide. Um, so the newer agents have shown that um, they're more effective in preventing uh, death from cardiovascular causes, future heart attacks or strokes. 
But if you look at the bottom, they had a key safety endpoint, which was bleeding. And so Prasugrel has a higher bleeding risk versus Plavix. So in Jehovah's Witness patients, we, we still use Prasugrel, but we use it with, uh, with caution if need be uh, to give the medication. Next slide. Um, Ticagrelor, on the other hand, um, showed to be beneficial more than Plavix in preventing death from vascular cause, non-fatal MI or death, but, um, but the bleeding risk was the same. So um, we do use Ticagrelor more and more. Next slide. So, um, so when we take a patient to the cath lab, and I'll show you an example at the end of the talk about how we open the artery and how we place a stent, but, um, but we're, the, the blood thinners such as heparin or the Lovenox we give during the case to keep that stent open. But once the stent is in place and the case is over, we continue the aspirin or the Plavix, the Ticagrelor or the Epian um, to keep those stents open after we are done. Um, and so that continues, we, um, the recommendations currently are to continue that for a year in somebody who's had a heart attack. And so, um, so again, that bleeding risk continues because we're giving you super aspirin for a year. Um, so care after we revascularize somebody includes monitoring for arrhythmias. We do an echocardiogram to assess um, how well their heart is pumping. Um, we assess risk factors, not only about how to prevent a future heart attack, but um, if you have bleeding issues such as ulcers or things like that, that, that again, these medications don't make you bleed. They make anything that is bleeding worse. So if you have a lesion in your colon or if you have bleeding in your stomach, anything like that, we should assess it and treat it at that point. We also start other medications. To prevent, um, to prevent your heart from sustaining more damage and uh, improving your risk factors that um, don't have anything to do with bleeding. Next slide. Um, so there are complications if uh, the later you present with a heart attack and they include uh, rupturing of the heart wall, um, acute leakage of the mitral valve, uh, holes that happen within the chambers of the heart or malignant arrhythmias. Um, the faster you open the artery and dissolve that clot, the more important it is because these complications can be catastrophic. Next slide. So we're gonna go on to that case presentation. And next slide. So we're gonna talk about a patient who, um, who was found down and 911 was called and he arrived um, receiving chest compressions, and um, being bagged by the paramedics. Um, there was no pulse um, when he presented. Next slide. And this was his EKG, and, and I don't expect you guys to read it, but it shows a malignant arrhythmia. He was in um, a rhythm called ventricular tachycardia that suggested that whatever caused him to, um, to become unconscious and in a coma was due to, uh, was coming from his heart. So um, we knew from his wife that he had, uh, next slide, yes, please, that he had um, end stage renal disease and was on dialysis. He had um, known um, decreased blood flow to his heart and his heart function was at 35%. The normal range is around 65% and he was a diabetic. Next slide. So we took him to the cath lab and here you can see a catheter, a black line that's going up on the left side of the screen. And then a little hockey stick appearing thing that is injecting contrast. And then what you see are the coronary arteries. Um, I, I'm gonna let this play a few times, but you have a yellow arrow, which points to where, um, where, the, um, where the blocked artery is. And as you can see, Everything fills in um, a lot um, a lot sooner, but this faint artery appears um, a lot later, and um, it's not as dark as the rest of the arteries. I don't expect you guys to be interventional cardiologists uh, in this 30-minute talk, but uh, this is what we're looking at. So this is the next slide, and you see 
a wire with um, a radio opaque uh, tip that is at the very bottom. And so that is in that artery. We got it through that plaque. We've given the blood thinners. And you see that the artery is coming into shape. We ballooned it, but we haven't put a stent in there yet. So next slide. Oh, I'm sorry, go back. So I apologize, that is after the stent. So um, that was after the stent. So you saw the blood flow a lot better. And, and this is the echocardiogram that we did. And we were, um, it's not playing very well, but it shows that we were able to save a significant amount of heart muscle. And it was very, um, very gratifying. This patient uh, came almost, um, almost about to pass away and he walked out of the hospital which was great. Um, he, did not, um, he did not need any blood transfusions. Um, he got very potent uh, blood thinning medications, but because we were appropriate and we were able to monitor him closely, um, we prevented him from having a catastrophic bleed, which is always a feared complication. Um, and so one word about bypass surgery, some of our very skilled um, CT surgeons are very good at uh, performing bypass in Jehovah's Witnesses and and um, and preventing significant blood loss. However, when you crack somebody's chest open, of course, you're going to have more blood loss than going up through a small one millimeter hole um, and putting catheters in the heart arteries and, and putting stents through um, a small wire. And so we always have this discussion. We don't prevent patients who, um, who have restrictions about blood products to go to uh, bypass surgery. However, we have a very good dialogue with our um, cardiothoracic colleague about what would be the best for the patient, not only to get more blood to the heart, but also to prevent uh, the bleeding and uh, some of the complications that we can anticipate with the medications we need to give. And with that, I'd like to say uh, thank you. It's a pleasure um, to, um, to talk to this group and thank you to um, Deborah and Alex for uh, putting on uh, this symposium. And thank you, Dr. Hendoyan. We really appreciate uh, you coming out, spending time with us. Uh, we know you're very busy. Like you said, you had just come off a case uh, helping a patient and I hope you have a, a a, a good day today and don't get too busy. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. But thank you. But Dr. Hendoyan is uh, at uh, Verdugo Hills Hospitals and he is also at uh, Keck Medical Center of USC. So we're very uh, fortunate to have him and, and the rest of our, of our cardiac team. So thank you so much. We appreciate it. Oh, anytime. Thank you. All right. So we're going to go ahead and transition over to Jessica. Jessica. Uh, you want to... Sorry, did you want to I'm take sorry. any questions? Oh, yes. For forgot Dr. about that. <laughs> sorry. Any questions? I do have one question. Let me start with, with one, if that's okay. Absolutely. Uh, there has been news recently about um, not taking low-dose aspirin. Uh, which is which was a big it's been a big deal i uh, i actually take low dose aspirin myself um but it's uh i guess new information or new studies have come out do you have any comments on that absolutely so that's a very uh very astute uh question and that has definitely been in the news recently and so um with baby aspirin we uh we want to give it with patients with coronary artery disease known coronary artery disease but just like I mentioned, um, you wanna uh, you wanna balance uh, bleeding versus uh, versus preventing a heart attack or preventing that plaque from forming, uh, that clot from forming. And so um, the new recommendations we used to tell people over the age of fifty you should just be on a baby aspirin. But because you could predispose somebody to GI bleeding, bleeding from um, other sources in the body without really getting a benefit, the new recommendations are only for people who have had known coronary artery disease. So it's a, I have taken patients off aspirin who would just take it prophylactically and who have no known coronary artery disease, but, um, but that number hasn't been um, 
a large number of patients uh, because in um, in the patient population that I see, a majority a majority of the patients have known coronary artery disease. Very good. Thank you for that. Um, I think Jack um, and Myrna had a question. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, I give my husband uh, in the morning. He takes Plavix, and so and I've been giving him a baby aspirin at night and in the morning. Is that overkill then? Um, well, it depends on the history. Usually, um, usually if you've had a stent, um, you do aspirin, eighty-one milligrams, and Plavix, seventy-five. I don't know. I would ask your cardiologist why you're taking an aspirin twice a day. That, that, seems, that seems a little odd, but, um, but I would do those medications in the morning because you don't want those medications to sit in the stomach because they can erode the lining of the stomach and cause an ulcer. So you want to take those medications usually with food earlier on in the day as opposed to in the evening. Can I ask one other question? Absolutely. Um, he had a minor heart attack and... Um, we gave him an aspirin to chew okay. right away. And uh, should I have also given him a Plavix at that no. time? No, 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 because you probably did not have a prescription for Plavix. So what you should do and what people do in the field when the paramedics arrive is give somebody an aspirin. So you, you did exactly the right thing. And, um, and if you received the stent or after the diagnosis, the cardiologist was probably the one who prescribed the Plavix. Thank you so much. Okay. Oh, it's my uh, Raph, Raphael and Jenny have a question. Yes, I'm wondering. Uh, I had a TIA about six years ago. Uh, am I a candidate that has to have aspirin all of the time? Uh, I also have other issues that may cause bleeding. So I'm just concerned is, is well, I think one of my doctors was saying that I uh, might use the, the 81 milligrams as, as a preventative. But uh, is a TIA was uh, just half of my body was uh, asleep or with the, it was in that completely. And I was able to talk and had no problems afterwards after that. So is that anything I should worry about? Uh, well, I think, I think continuing the aspirin is a good idea um, because if it was a little clot, just like a clot could block, block the artery to the heart, it blocks the artery to the brain. And so, um, so having a little aspirin to prevent those, um, those platelets from um, clumping together and causing a clot is a good idea. And 81 milligrams is a good dose. It's not gonna, it's not gonna cause um, a major bleed, but um, you should be careful because you do have a history of bleeding. But I would continue. Um, and I thought, La LaVonda, you had your hand up earlier. Was your question answered or? Actually, I had a cardiac arrest. Oh, I don't think your microphone's working. We can't hear you. Okay. Sorry. Why don't you work on that? Is that better? Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, when I was 34, I had a heart event. I have cardiomyopathy and um, I have a mitral valve prolapse with mitral regurgitation. And for years, mm -hmm. it was um suggested that I take the lower dose aspirin. Um, at this time I my cardiologist hasn't really um, strongly encouraged it, but we are working on things to see if I can lower um, lower my medications because I take um, carvedilol and then the ones for blood pressure. Mm -hmm. But um, is I guess what my guy I'm trying to form it into a question. Sorry about that. Um, is with the cardiomyopathy with the enlarging of the heart, is that something that would also be affected by whether the, um, the thinning of the blood would make that easier to work with or is it gonna, um, or is it gonna cause more complication? So, uh... So it's not gonna it's not gonna help the heart remodel by taking an aspirin or not. Um, you taking the carvedilol and the other medications is probably what's gonna help the heart uh, get stronger. 
but with a cardiomyopathy and a decreased ejection fraction, you are at a risk of forming a clot in the heart muscle because the blood isn't moving as well through the heart. And so that might have been one of the reasons why they put you on aspirin. But if there's no clot on the echo, um, it's probably okay for you to stop it. The other thing is if you have a history of atrial fibrillation, um, which is um, an abnormal heart rhythm, they might prescribe you aspirin for that. But, um, but if you haven't had those, then um, I would talk to your cardiologist one more time and say, hey, do we absolutely need the aspirin? Because the aspirin is not helping your heart get strong. Got it. Thank you. Of course. I see, Sai, you have your hand up. Yes. Um, if a patient presents to the hospital with clots in the lung, is, uh, what would be the treatment? Would it be by uh, thinning or would it be like an intervention of sorts to try to um, you know, bust the clot? So that is a very good question. And uh, it's funny, we had a patient um, from one of the CAC hospitals, from Norris Hospital that we treated yesterday, who had a surgery and had a clot form in his leg that traveled to his lung. So if somebody's unstable or their oxygen requirements are going up, they actually go up from the heart into the lung arteries and drop those fibrinolytics that I was talking about into right on top of the clot to help dissolve it. So, um, so if um, that's to acutely help them and get them out of trouble. Now, if a patient um, has a clot in their lungs as diagnosed on a CT scan, but, um, but they're doing okay clinically, we do put them on blood thinners um, such as Coumadin or Eliquis or Xeralto to help thin their blood. Yes, and also uh, I heard the term uh, saddle embolism. Correct. How serious is that? A saddle embolism is, can be catastrophic. And um, those are the ones that we do take uh, to the cath lab to do an acute intervention because you could die from a saddle embolism. Okay, thank you very much. It's my pleasure. All right, Jessica, you have your hand raised. Or your virtual hand, I should I do, say. I do. Oh, well, <laughs> since, since we have um, such a great um, audience of community members, Dr. Hendoyan, I wonder if you could just review with us, what are the signs and symptoms that are concerning for cardiac conditions. So what, is, what are some of the things that I really need to take seriously and make sure that I get some help right away versus something that eh, maybe it's nothing and I'll just walk it off or wait a little while and hope, for the, hope that it goes away. Um, so first, if you could just review the signs and symptoms of cardiac um, conditions that need attention right away. And then if you would be able to talk a little bit about sometimes uh, the differences between the way that men present with, with heart attacks and the way that women present with heart attacks. So those are very good questions. So um, the, typical, uh, the typical symptoms um, that you see uh, when it comes to a heart attack is pressure like chest pain that is right uh, under the sternum. Um, it, there is some uh, pressure that radiates uh, to the neck or to the jaw, and sometimes to the small of the back. And it's worse with exertion or emotional stress. They also get left arm heaviness. Now, those are the classic symptoms. Um, like I mentioned in the talk, diabetics, people who've had heart transplants, uh, the elderly and females tend to have more atypical presentations. They get more, um, more shortness of breath. They might not get the substernal chest pain. They might um, just get um, an ache in the back or they might get some nausea that is not going away. Now, um, the more persistent something is, um, it needs more attention. If it's causing, there's an acute change that, hey, you know, I was able to uh, walk the block without any issues, but now, I have to stop three times. Don't just say, oh, it's because I'm getting old. It's, it's something that needs, um, that needs acute attention. Um, I think what I would use as, as a marker about when to get attention, if things are progressing slowly, but um, you, you see symptoms, 
I would go see your cardiologist as an outpatient. But if you see something that is like, if, if the thought ever crosses your mind that, oh, you know, something doesn't feel right, I might need to call 911. Don't just say, I'll, I'll wait, wait a little bit longer and see if it'll go away. I would just go and get checked out because um, there are patients who, um, you know, you hear about this, like they have symptoms. They're like, oh, let me see how it is in the morning. I would um, at the very least get in touch with a health professional to just discuss it because um, you're going to be able to triage it based on your symptoms pretty good and, and give you um, the right advice. Now, there are, we've only talked about heart attacks. There are other um, other um, cardiac conditions, including heart failure and arrhythmias and uh, valvular heart disease that present, some present in a similar way, some present in a very different way. So um, it's imperative that, um, that you talk um, to a cardiologist about, about describing your symptoms because you might be thinking that you're giving some vague symptoms but um, with an EKG and an astute cardiologist who listens to you, they're going to be able to determine um, with a great deal of accuracy whether this is um, a blocked artery or if it's an arrhythmia or if it's a valvular issue or uh, if it's heart failure and then order the appropriate test for you to get a conclusive diagnosis and um, appropriate treatment. Thank you, Dr. Noyan. I think we probably have time for one more question. Is that okay? Um, I see. I know Eddie had his hand raised earlier, so let's take Eddie and then Randy. I can't not call on you because <laughs> <laughs> maybe two questions, Eddie and then Randy. Thank you so much. Uh, my question is, uh, if uh, you have a patient who is absolutely uh, cannot have a blood transfusion, uh, for example, a Jehovah's Witnesses, of course, and they have uh, multiple uh, problems going on and they're anemic and uh, they have to undergo this uh, uh, a surgery or whatever it may be, and they uh, have, the, have the possibility it could cause a bleeding problem, which is the drug that you recommend to to administer that can be reversed maybe if it's uh, if it becomes a danger, which one, which drug, even if it's uh, not a common known, would you recommend for that type of situation? Am I saying that right? Yeah, no, I, um, I your question is, is very appropriate. So it depends on the timing and what type of heart attack they're having. So um, there, there are things that you could do um, before a case, such as uh, starting a patient on iron if uh, to boost up their uh, blood count. During a case, um, we are very careful with drawing back blood uh, to make sure that we're not pulling away more blood than we have to. Um, the heparin that we give uh, during a case can be reversed. Um, and then but most importantly is having good procedural techniques because if we're able to puncture the artery and then close it without you bleeding afterwards, that is probably the most important part about it. Now with um, Plavix or Ticagrelor, there's no uh, reversal agents, but it just takes time for it to get out of the system. Um, and so uh, I think it's just having an open dialogue with the patient and then saying, for these reasons, we're going to start these medications first, or we're going to be very cautious during the case because we know that you're anemic and you're a Jehovah's Witness. And then after the case, uh, depending on how everything goes, is determining which one of those uh, potent blood thinning medications would be the safest for you while continuing those measures of iron and trying to boost up your blood count. Fantastic. Thank you very much. I just want to take one minute to thank you very much uh, for your work in working with patients like Jehovah's Witnesses to help us in the best way possible. And uh, I just want to tell you, thank you very much for that. Oh, it's my pleasure. And we have wonderful people like Alex and Randy who are just wonderful liaisons that make our job so much easier and, and help facilitate that conversation. And we're forever grateful to them. Randy, did you 
Yes, Deborah. I'll try to make it quick. Thank you, Deborah. Thanks, Alex. Uh, Jessica working behind the scenes to put this uh, seminar together. Dr. Hendoy, of course, thank you so much. Uh, my question, as you mentioned, working with CT surgery colleagues, Dr. Hendoyan, and uh, briefly, that discussion that takes place as far as when bypass surgery is more favorable than PCI. Could you just comment maybe a couple of factors related to that? Absolutely. So, so um, you're going to bleed more when you have your chest cut open versus going through a small hole in your leg. And so depending on um, your blood count, your risk, of bleeding, like let's say you have a history of ulcers, you have a history of uh, bleeding from other sites, all those get factored in. And then, um, and then the surgeon's um, confidence in how quickly they could go in and get out, um, because the longer you're in there, the more um, chances there are about bleeding. Now they have things like cell saver and other things, other methods that they could employ if, uh, if a bypass surgery is not urgent, um, like I said, they might start you on iron supplementation earlier to get your blood counts up. But regardless, um, you have that discussion, um, knowing the full history of the patient with your CT surgery colleague, and then you make the decision together. And, um, but you never, you, you always wanna do what's right medically first. And so you'll recommend uh, bypass surgery and, and after um, a patient has had the discussion with the surgeon, their input, the surgeon's input, and the cardiologist's input is all factored with the patient's in, uh, input being the most important and, um, and the decisions made on how to proceed, whether it's stents or bypass surgery. But my particular philosophy is never restrict a patient because they're a Jehovah's Witness from a potential therapy. It's um, the patient needs to uh, hear their options, hear the bleeding risk from the, from the potential doctor who's going to uh, perform the procedure and then, and then give their input as to how they would like to proceed because they're the ones who are going to be dealing with the consequences, um, God forbid, uh, something like that happen, were to happen. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for your questions. Thank you, Dr. Hendoyan. And uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and stop those questions now. We can get, proceed with, with, uh, with Jessica. And thank you, Dr. Hendoyan, again, for being with us. Thank you for your time and your care and your expertise. It's my pleasure. And you guys have a great day. And you guys have a great talk coming up with Jessica. She's up soon. <laughs> Great, thank you. Okay, now we can introduce Jessica. Thanks everyone. <laughs> Hi, thank you so much for your time. And I just have to say, I love speaking with this group. Um, I love when we let everyone into the virtual room and you're just so friendly and greeting one another and tell that you really enjoy being in, a, in one another's presence. Um, and that's what we're, uh, we're about. We're community members taking care of our community here at uh, Verdugo Hills Hospital. We are your neighbors, we're your friends, we're your nieces and nephews and moms and dads. Um, and it is our, our pleasure um, to, to be able to, to serve you uh, in, in healthcare. We love what we do. It's hard work, but we love what we do. Um, and we love the opportunity to talk with you and educate you about what we can do for you and how you can take uh, very good care of yourselves as well. My name is Jessica Thomas. I am an administrator at USC Verdugo Hills Hospital. I'm a nurse by trade, a cardiac nurse. I've worked in coronary care units and intensive care units my entire career, as well as with uh, emergency services. And uh, so I'm a, a nurse number one, um, and then an administrator number two. And I just wanna tell you a little bit about uh, what services we have that support Dr. Hendoyan and his work at Verdugo Hills Hospital. So you can move to the next slide. So we are very excited to let you know that we are launching our very own interventional radiology and cardiac cath lab at Verdugo Hills Hospital. We have not had one in our almost 50 year history up until this point, and I'll uh, show you some construction photographs in a little bit. Um, but coming soon in summer of 2022, we anticipate being able to conduct diagnostic uh, um, diagnostic procedures, just being able to determine why are you having the symptoms that you are? And we can, we'll be able to do some cardiac catheterization procedures in order to help diagnose. 
Then once we're uh, fully up and running with that and the diagnostics, then we'll be able to do interventional PCIs, which is what Dr. Ndoyan was talking about. Percutaneous coronary interventions are placing little stents to help keep the coronary arteries open. We'll be progressing to that in the late summer uh, and next winter. And then we'll be progressing to being able to take care of um, urgent and emergent, those STEMI uh, patients to be able to go in and take them immediately to the cardiac cath lab, uh, right, um, right in your neighborhood, right at Vertigo Hills Hospital. We'll have the latest technologies. We're getting all of the, the greatest uh, equipment with the bells and whistles. We're starting to train up our staff already and recruiting uh, the highest caliber doctors and nurses to work in our cath lab um, and working on progressive techniques. How can we best do uh, cardiac cath procedures? We're not relying on 20 and 30 year old uh, technology. We have uh, a dynamic cardiology group and interventional cardiologists who are at the top of their game and practicing uh, innovative techniques, as well as those that um, have been proven to have to be best practices. You can move to the next slide. So here uh, we're looking at the cardiac cath lab as it is that's here on the, the, the left side of your screen where it says do not enter. You can see we've got uh, construction hot and heavy in underway. And what we're, what we're doing right here is we're sitting in the control room of the cardiac cath lab and looking out into cath lab room one. And if you look on the right hand side of the screen, you'll see a, an artist's rendition of what it's going to look like in just a few short months. So we're very excited. Uh, we're all wearing hard hats when we enter into that area. We're conducting tours um, for our staff. And as I said, we're already undergoing uh, training and uh, recruiting of the highest caliber individuals to, to work in this new department. Next slide, please. So I just uh, wouldn't, would be remiss if I didn't remind uh, the group that we do have a top-notch emergency department um, right here in your backyard um, on Verdugo Boulevard. Uh, we're a full service emergency department. Um, we really strive to uh, demonstrate compassion in our work every day. And we also have uh, expertise with transfusion-free medicine. And Alex has done an amazing job in help, helping our uh, team understand uh, the best way to care for, uh, for this, this community. Um, and so we're well-versed in processes and procedures um, and how we can conduct that in the most respectful manner and what's best for you. So you're very welcome to come to the emergency department at, at Verdugo. Um, identify yourself and we, uh, we certainly know how to take care of you. We're approved by the LA County Emergency Medical Service as an emergency department um, with uh, pediatric expertise. So we take care of patients before they're born all the way until they're as old as people can get. So uh, the full spectrum of the life cycle, but especially with uh, pediatric emergency care, our nurses and doctors are, have uh, special training and we have special equipment to care for um, our little people. And then also our ED has gained national recognition um, for nursing expertise, for compassionate care, um, as well as uh, our hospital support for specialty nursing certification. Um, so that we're sure, again, that we have the highest caliber uh, individuals working in our department and ready to take care of you. So that's, that's just a, a little snippet of what I wanted to share with you today. Uh, if you have any questions about the hospital, uh, what we do, uh, anything about the emergency department or any questions about our cath lab that is on the way, um, I'll be happy to share with you what I can. Uh, Jessica, I do have a question. This is Alex. Mm -hmm. uh, so with the new cath lab coming in, and we're all excited about that, um, what are some of the services, if you can highlight them again, that we'll eventually be able to do uh, at Verdugo? Um, what other services in the, in the cath lab? Right, especially relating to emergency room. Well, for the emergency room, we'll, we'll be able to take care of um, part, part of a, a cath lab cath lab is also the ability to do interventional radiology procedures. And by that, um, I mean not necessarily only 
um, cardiac or coronary procedures. We may be able to help patients with um, blood clots in the lungs, as was, was uh, described earlier, being able to place stents um, eventually uh, in the brain, in the, in the heart, in the leg, um, in some of the other major vessels of the body. Um, so that's, that's also uh, upcoming. I tailored the thought, the, the talk to our coronary interventions because we had our coronary interventionist um, as our uh, star attraction today. Um, but there are many capabilities that, uh, that this will allow our hospital to do to take care of the community. Excellent, thank you. Mm -hmm. I see that Anthony, you have your hand raised or your virtual hand raised. So when you have a patient who identifies as one of Jehovah's Witnesses, mm -hmm. uh, how do you administratively uh, respond to that? Great question. So uh, Keck Medicine uses a, uh, we've, we've identified uh, seafoam green as the color for our transfusion free patients. So uh, once we have a patient who I identifies um, as transfusion free, we place a seafoam green uh, band on your, on your wrist so that we know um, that these are, this, this provides us a, a speed bump, so to speak. Um, so that uh, as we're, um, putting together the plan of care that we, uh, that we know that this is a, a special consideration we need to make sure that we ask about. So uh, if there are any papers that are part of your chart, they're in a seafoam green binder and you've got the seafoam green um, band on, on your wrist. Again, just that visual speed bump, as well as in your electronic medical record, there's a little banner that's at the top um, next to your name and your age that um, also identifies um, you administratively as a transfusion-free patient. So we're building in some of these system controls so that our staff has that visual speed bump. Oh, hey, I need to make sure that uh, the treatment plan that we're putting together is consistent with your values. Um, so it may prompt an additional question or it may even prompt another member of the team maybe asking some of the same questions just to validate that to make sure that we're proceeding in the way that's most appropriate. Very much appreciate. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. um, Jay Strib, you have a question? Yes, Jessica, you ought to be doing transplants here, right? I'm sorry. At your hospital, will you be doing transplants at your hospital, right? We do um, our with our health in our health system. We do do transplants at Keck Medical Center, which is one of the hospitals within our health system. Oh, okay. Well, I've already registered with them. I just thought that maybe you, because you all are uh, like a subsidiary of Keck or something. Yes, yes. So Keck Medical Center is the, is the main medical center within the health system. And we are uh, one of the community hospitals within the okay, health system. Okay. So we do, we do have several doctors who practice at both of the hospitals in, in the system. Um, some of the specialty surgeries, um, because of the number of times that they do the surgery, it's better mm -hmm. to have it done at the main campus rather than at one of the community hospitals. Um, we just want to make sure that we're directing our patients with, within the, the Keck family, so to speak, um, to the location where they um, have the highest frequency and the most expertise um, in caring for that particular condition. So there may be some, some conditions that we, you would come to Verdugo because we have the expertise in those, in those areas, such as mental health, such as women and family services. Uh, we are uh, growing in our perinatal and birthing center. Um, our urology service is, is certainly an area of expertise for us, as well as orthopedics. Um, and then Keck Medical Center, their expertise is in um, heart, lung, kidney, liver transplants, pancreas transplants, um, and some of the um, higher end and more complex surgeries. Um, they're, they're the arm or the branch that would handle those types of conditions. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, Jack and Myrna, I see your hand is raised, is that correct? Yeah, I was just curious. Um, we've been to Keck uh, USC for some uh, hip surgery and knee surgery and that type of thing. Um, is the bloodless uh, um, 
attitude uh, throughout the whole system, or is it just in Verdugo? It's throughout the system. Uh, so Randy and Alex have worked very hard to uh, to do a lot of education for our physicians and nursing team, um, as well as our administrative team. Um, it, uh, the transfusion free program uh, initiated at Keck Medical Center and has uh, has moved uh, to Verdugo within the last two or three years. Um, so that's definitely a value for us system wide um, to ensure that uh, transfusion free uh, patients are welcomed at all of our locations. And as our health system continues to grow, we'll make sure that the transfusion free uh, support, uh, the attitude that you mentioned, uh, will maintain a value for, for us even as we continue to grow. Thank you. Certainly. I don't see any other hands raised. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. We appreciate that. And if I can interject, um, your, uh, Regards uh, regarding to attitude or actually culture, so we're very uh, very proud of our culture uh, at uh, all of our uh, USC medical um, uh, medicine USC medicine uh, or part of Keck Medicine of USC I should say you're mumbling here, uh, but uh, the attitude or the culture is very inclusive and we're very proud that for more than 20 years we've been able to to work with our Jehovah's Witness community and be very respectful. Uh, for their wishes. So the uh, reputation is there as well as the, the experience. So we're very happy about that. Um, I just wanted to circle back. One of the questions that uh, Jessica was answering, not only do we have the armbands and all that other stuff, I actually have some armbands right here that you can see um, and our, our binders. We have a handy binder here. I don't know if you can see that. Oh. I'm going in and out. There you go. It's kind of hard to see. But uh, we there, also there's have, that green. <laughs> yeah, there's a green. Uh, we have a blood refusal form that we use that will complement the no blood card or the uh, advanced directed card and a product treatment form that goes into other items that are related to blood that are that fall under the uh, minor blood fractions or proteins and the use of machines. So we have this discussion with the patients to make sure that we understand what their wishes are, aside from not accepting transfusions, which is red cells, platelets, plasma but also um, um, other items that are related, the use of machines that involve the use of your own blood, as well as the use of, uh, of other items uh, like medications and things like that. So uh, we wanna make sure we've got all that information and we understand what your wishes are. So we're able to support you uh, through your, uh, your journey here at, uh, at USC. So Alex, someone sent me a direct message. So you probably didn't see it. Um, they don't have a camera or a microphone. So oh. they asked me to ask this question. I was wondering about the change and what we need to give the hospital regarding no use of blood. I've always used my card that I carry in my wallet and that was acceptable. A friend of mine had surgery last week and he was given a form with all kinds of questions that he was told was now was what was required from Cat Verdugo Hospital. So this has changed, question mark. Would it be wise to get that form from the hospital to fill it out to have on file at the hospital for future procedures? The question. Yeah, so that's the form I was actually mentioning now. Okay. Um, yes, yeah, so we always encourage patients to, to have their advanced directive because that speaks for you when you can't. Uh, and many will also add on there items that are acceptable to them like uh, the use of albumin, erythropoietin, which are products that have minor blood fractions in them, um, or uh, the use of machines. Uh, and then when they come here, we have them sign a blood refusal form, which complements that, that states that they do not want transfusions in their care, and they understand the risks that are involved. And then you've got that other form that goes, that's basically a listing of all the items that really fall under personal decision matters for a Jehovah's Witness patient, which are, is a listing of medications and the use of machines. So it's our laundry list of, of products. Doesn't mean they're necessarily gonna be used, but we want our patients to let us know how they feel about them. Um, and then we are able to offer education too. So if uh, you can't remember what these are, don't know what these are, uh, we will certainly educate you so you can make a good conscious decision as to what items you're, you're okay with accepting. So that's a very important to us, very important to the medical staff. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, a couple of weeks ago, one of Dr. Hendoyan's patient was coming through. Patient did not want to fill out the form. Guess what? Dr. Hendoyan was not going to do the procedure. 
So the, the patient finally said, okay, let me take a look at it. Uh, and, and we were able to help them through the, with the form and give them education so they can make a good decision. So it's really important to our staff, our medical team to understand what you will and will not accept aside from no transfusion. So it's very, very important. That's why it's important to do your homework, um, understand what items are available. Uh, that way, if you are refusing transfusion, like, like the Jehovah's Witness community is, that you understand what alternatives are out there that you can accept or not accept. That way you can voice them to us. Um, I have another question in the chat. Um, sorry, Jessica, and, and I think this this was supposed to be the person who's asking it said it was for it was for Dr. Ndoyan, but he left. I don't know if you can answer it. If not, it might be a question that has to be directed to a physician, but my wife has on a regular basis shortness of breath. And when we told our primary care, um, she found that it was likely caused by a blood pressure medicine. Tests don't seem to show any problems related to a restricted blood vessel. Why does amelioride seem to be doing the same? Or what can we do about that issue? Our records are at CAC Hospital in San, in San Pablo. So, okay. Well, thank you for the question. Um, it, this sounds like it may be more uh, be better addressed with your, with your physician. Um, I can tell you that many uh, medications besides the, the primary action can cause a cascade of side effects and some can be uh, more troublesome than others. Um, and if you have a medication that's causing you um, a, a, an activity limiting shortness of breath, certainly that's something to have a conversation with your physician if this is the, the, the only agent available to, to treat that condition, or if there might be um, another medication or another agent that would not have that side effect or that effect on your body um, that may, maybe should, should warrant a try. Because certainly shortness of breath can, can be troublesome, it can be worrisome, it can limit your activities in ways that um, are undesirable, certainly. Um, and so finding an alternative together with your doctor is um, probably a good idea. Um, and I see Martha, you have your hand raised. Yes, uh, Martha. Hello, and thank you for, for the information. I'm requesting, is it possible to get uh, those forms blank uh, emailed to us, uh, Alex? Uh, certainly, I can, I can definitely share that with you. Uh, they're also available on our website, um, our transfusion free website. Okay. But if you want to send me your, if, you, if you're able to do it on the chat there, uh, okay. put your name in there, I'd be happy to. Thank you. That to you. Martha, it's Martha Sanchez, right? Let's Correct. Correct. Okay. Yeah, I'd be happy to share those with you. And I see yeah. Bill, Bill Robertson is trying to, he's, can I he's interject raising something his, real quick, his real hand. Yeah, Deborah, can I interject something real quick? Sure, sure, sure. Really and cool then, and then we're going to go to Bill because I don't want him to think we're not paying attention. No, no, not at all. Uh, <laughs> as, as Alex mentioned, so something that's come up over the many years. So that form, it's a, it's a hospital document. It's not a legal document, right, specific to Keck. Uh, so even though it exists on our website, I know some patients over the years have asked about using it elsewhere. Some may fill it out, they attach it to their advanced healthcare director. So it's keeping in mind that that, is, that form is not a legal document. It is specific to Keck Medicine, as Alex mentioned, Redugo Hills, Norris, and uh, Keck USC. It's important to keep that in mind too, I feel. All right. Thank you, Randy. Yeah, thank you if, but Bill, can you unmute yourself and ask your question? There we go. Yes, I hope this isn't too far off the off the, the radar here. Um, my wife conducts a study with a, a um, young adult that um, who is um, in a has a very rare form of a blood uh, disease called uh, diamond black fan anemia. Uh, which she is currently being treated. Uh, the only treatment that they've been able to offer thus far is a transfusion because it, it deals basically with uh, the marrow doesn't make enough of the right type of red blood cells. Um, there may be nothing new to know about this, but where would, where would I go um, within the Keck system to, to find out about that if there is anything they can offer to this person? should they decide not to take transfusions, which looks like they may be going to do in the near future? Mm -hmm. Well, one of, the, one of the great things about um, a, an academic medical center um, like Keck Medical Center, um, really, um, 
I would pose this question to either a hematologist or a cardiologist who may be able to access the uh, medical databases at Keck School of Medicine, um, which is where all the latest, pub you know, all the latest uh, studies and, and evidence is published um, to um, medical databases that are not generally available to the general public. Um, but they are available to healthcare professionals and ask, just point blank, ask them to do some digging and see if there are any new studies that have come for the treatment of this uh, rare anemia and, and the resulting conditions, looking for treatment aspects. Um, uh, the academic physicians are, are well versed with uh, the latest evidence or how to conduct searches for the latest evidence. Um, and they've got those resources right at their, um, at the, at their fingertips, so to speak. So um, I would probably direct, direct you to either a hematologist um, or a, a cardiologist. Hematologist is probably more, um, um, more of an accurate specialty, um, but just ask them, could you just search, do, do a database search? Um, because there's always new evidence that's coming out and published. And we know that there's a gap between when new studies and new knowledge is generated and when it actually reaches the bedside. And so there are times when a really proactive patient such as yourself or a patient advocate such as yourself needs to ask the question, what does the evidence say? And ask them, even though they haven't heard about it, just know that there's generally a 10 to 15 year gap between the latest research and the time that it actually reaches the bedside and becomes part of standard practice. That's a really long time. And many patients, you don't have that time depending on what the, what the, the, uh, the condition may be. So um, as, a, as a point of advocacy for yourself and for your loved ones, ask the question, what is the, what's the latest thing? What are, what are the journals saying? Um, would you mind taking a look and, and getting back to me if there's anything that's been published um, recently that um, you haven't seen yet? And that way you're holding open the door um, for those innovative techniques um, and for us all to, to be able to learn and get better at what we do. But sometimes physicians and other providers need to be prompted um, to dig a little deeper. Um, and I say that as, as a clinician myself, um, ask the questions and um, uh, it, it certainly can only help. Thank you, That's, uh, that, that is very helpful. And I know it's nice to see a group of people like I see at uh, USC that is uh, uh, reaching out like this. Mm -hmm. I think about this person, it's um, right now it's a little bit hopeless and there may not be anything new, but I know a couple mm -hmm. of years ago, I read an article in Scientific American that talked about the fact that people need to look for doctors and physicians that are willing to do that digging because um, it's so easy to just offer what's readily available without researching, as you said. So right, thank you. Right, right. Best of luck to you and your friend. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. If I can interject, um, if you'd like, reach out to, to me. Uh, we might be able to connect you with some of the hematologists, oncologists mm -hmm. yeah. here at, uh, at Keck um, on the Norris side. Um, I mean, we have some pretty renowned uh, hematologists that mm -hmm. have, you know, really done a lot of research and, with, and have really helped with a lot of the medications that are on the market now as well as uh, uh, you know, uh, clinical studies that are out there. So uh, please reach out to us, see if we can be a resource aside from whatever physician uh, your friend is, uh, is uh, being helped by and see if we could be another, another source for you. Okay, but again, we're sorry Thank you, about I that. appreciate that. I yes. know that, uh, I know that your, your, your email address was given in uh, uh, the uh, information. Would it be okay if I dropped it? Of course. It? Yes, okay. please email me and let's see if we can connect you with some good resources here. Yeah, okay. thank you. So we're, we're pretty much out of time. Um, we're gonna go ahead and end it now. It's, we're, we've gone a little bit over. So we appreciate uh, all your questions. We appreciate your time. We want to um, uh, ask you to please be alert for our future uh, events that will be coming around probably first of the year. Um, and please contact us. You have my email address that you can use. 
be happy to uh, help you navigate to, through our USC system, which obviously comprises of Keck USC, uh, Norris Comprehensive Cancer Center, and USC Verdugo Hills Hospital. Um, and um, please to, uh, feel free to go to our website also uh, to look for um, some of these forms, for example, and information about our program. Uh, you can find us at uh, transfusionfree.usc.edu. Um, and also find us on Instagram. We just launched our Instagram page and we'll be able to communicate with you through there too. So uh, we'll send out a notice about that. Uh, that way you can be in the loop uh, about any new happenings at, our, at the USC um, uh, system or kick medicine of USC. So thank you so much again. And uh, we uh, wish you a great day. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Alex. Thanks, Randy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Jessica. And thank you, Deborah. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Have a great, have a great day. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. No mentor. Hey, Carl Gustafson. If you've got my phone number, send me a text. Uh, okay. I will. Thanks, Carl. It's good to see everybody. Thanks. Good to see all of you. I want to talk to you if you get a chance. Okie doke. Bye. Bye-bye.